one to the, what is today? Thank you. Uh, July 23 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, first item on our agenda is a uh, call to order and we are missing three members tonight. Um, absent is uh, Ms. Jordan, uh, Mr. Tranfaglia, and Mr. LaPlante, present Dr. Chapmas, uh, Mr. Keneally, uh, Ms. Miller, um, and myself. Um, although we have a quorum with four people, we do have one item on our agenda that is a request for a variance, and that is the um, appeal of Kevin and Lisa Hutman. Do we have someone here representing the Hutmans? My name is David Jones. I'm representing the Hutmans. Uh, Mr. Jones, because the um, rules require that there be at least four members voting in support of the granting of a variance, it means that the uh, vote would have to be unanimous this evening with only four members sitting. Um, that obviously puts you at some risk. If any one member of the board should vote against it, the, uh, your appeal would be denied. Because there are only four members here, you have an option to either go forward tonight or um, have the matter uh, continued until next month's meeting. And, and you don't need to make that decision at this moment, but I simply want to let you know that. Now, if you do want at this point to continue it so you can take off, you're welcome to do that. We also may have two more members show up in the next few minutes. Um, we were only given advance notice by one of the members that he wouldn't be here. So we're actually expecting both Ms. Jordan and Mr. LaPlante to be here. And maybe they're just running a little bit late. So. I appreciate the advice. I will uh, talk with uh, uh, the other folks who are here with me tonight. And if, if you have, do you have any other business to, to uh, cover? Well, we do have, well, we did have <laughs> one other item before you. Um, if the other party is uh, ready to go, um, we can skip over you and do the last item on our agenda first. Um, if you want to try and buy a little more time, and hopefully two more members will show up. I'm hoping that we're going to have six people here tonight. Okay, very good. Um, well, first item on our agenda is old business, and we have something carried forward that we've had on our agenda for two or three months now. Actually, before we do that, I'm skipping something. Um, let's go back to approval of the minutes of June 25. I'm actually taking things out of order here. Let's go back to the right order. You might want to mention the first two cases in case there's somebody here. Okay. Um, if there is anyone here on the request of David, is it Ginn? G yeah. David, is there anyone here for the Ginn matter? 5 Seabar um, 5 Seabarn Road? No? Okay because that matter has been taken off the agenda. Okay, let's go back to approval of the minutes of June 25, 2002. Um, comments from members of the board on the minutes as submitted. Barbara, I thought these were excellent. Your usual good job. Um, the only thing that, that I would really like to see, if you don't mind adding them, um, on the, uh, on page four of the minutes, where we voted on the various elements, uh, the eight different elements required for approval of the variance, rather than simply reference the fact that we voted on the eight elements, if you could actually list uh, the eight elements in the minutes. I think that's helpful for anybody in the future who reads the minutes to know what the different elements are. Uh, 
and ms miller has just pointed out on page two line thirteen a reference to mr miller when he wasn't here mr was not invited to the meeting but this better have ms miller was so if we could change that to ms miller find 26 the same thing and ms jordan has joined us we are now up to five hopefully soon to be six um, back to the minutes uh, could i have a motion for approval of the minutes as submitted um, subject to the amendment uh, for changing mr miller to ms miller and listing the eight elements uh, required for the approval of the variance. So moved. Uh, motion, Mr. Keneally. Second. Second, Ms. Miller. All those in favor? Um, Ms. Uh, Jordan abstains since she wasn't here last month, so the motion is approved. Uh, four in favor, zero opposed. Next item on the agenda is old business, and that is something that's been on our agenda a few times before, to hear the request of Stephen and Sarita Solomon for Kettle Cove Road, tax map U16, lot 7A, for a front property line variance of 9 feet 0 inches from the required 25 feet, a left side property line variance of 5 feet 0 inches from the required 25 feet, and a right side property line variance of 15 feet 0 inches from the required 25 feet uh, to replace the existing ranch with a one and a half story cape with attached porch. Um, I take it, uh, Mr. Smith, that we still do not have an application from them in support of this? That's, that's true. I called down to where they live three separate occasions, got a response on the second, was in the office. Never did get, she, they never did call back after my third call. I called Northeast Civil Solutions, who was, who was supposed to be doing the work for them. They said that they were on hold because um, Solomon's needed to submit some, some, some uh, paperwork for them to continue, and they have not done so yet. So it sounds like they may want to still be on board, but I haven't had the opportunity to actually talk to them. Um, I certainly can write a letter to them saying that we're not going to carry this if you, if that's your wishes. Well, it, it seems silly for us to even take the time to address at each meeting if there's nothing in front of us. Um, so I think I'd like to suggest with the board's approval that we simply remove it from the agenda, not carry it forward as old business, um, unless and until they actually submit an application for us to consider. Well, it's either it's either on the agenda as a carried forth item, or if, if you take it off, the problem with that is we'd have to go out and re-advertise again because it wouldn't be carried forth to, to the people who may be concerned about that application. So it either has to be carried forth or drop completely, and they'd have to reapply. Mm -hmm. I move we carry it forward, not talk about it again until it's here. I move we drop it formally. Mm -hmm. I think that this has gone on for enough months that if they've paid a fee, I believe it's got to be forfeited at this point. Uh, they have not taken any initiative to, to stay in touch with uh, the CEO of the board. I believe that we ought to just drop it. But if it's easier for Bruce to have it on the agenda so he doesn't have to re-advertise it. I'd rather just keep it on the agenda, just not talk about it, and push it aside each month and not have to make Bruce do more work. Right, what, what is the problem with re-advertising? No problem, except that somebody's going to have to foot that bill. I mean, we've done it once, and, and, and once, if, as long as we carry it forward, we don't have to re-advertise. Well, who foots the bill, the town or the applicants for well, advertising? If, if it's dropped from the agenda, meaning you've decided not to hear it because they didn't come forward, then they'd have to formally apply. If you just decide to 
keep it, allow them to come forward at some future day, then I think it behooves the town to continue to keep it on the agenda or we'd have to re-advertise and somebody would have to put the bill, so. Yeah, but who foots that bill? <laughs> I don't. Who pays the well, advertising expense? Well, I guess I'd have to know what the board pleasure is before I could answer that. Well, do they, um, only, do they, they they've paid an application fee? Correct, of, which covers advertising one time. Mm -hmm. So if we drop it, do they need to reapply? If you drop it from the, if you want to drop it from the agenda, yes. They pay a new, they knew, they pay a new application fee. They'd have to start all over again. Which would cover the advertising costs. Maybe they need to be notified that it's under consideration that we are going to drop it from the agenda and that there'll be an expense associated with it. I could write so a letter at least give them during a this month and that, that would probably you're get going them. to have to reapply if, uh, if you don't carry forward with this agenda item. By the next meeting. By so the next meeting, because I, I, I have agree. no problem with that. I agree. I think it's silly to care, keep talking about it, but at least give them a heads up that it's going to cost them some money and they've got some work to do. It, it's been advertised once already. That's correct. How does the cost of the advertising compare with the application fee they put in? It's, it's a matter of, of, of the advertising cost, the notification to abutters, and the time right. the office spends. So. I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. The, the, the town has incurred an expense already that probably is in excess of their first application fee, and that's they have not bothered to stay in touch with the town on this. So right. I'm in favor of having it be dropped and requiring them to reapply simply because the economics of the situation dictate that. Well, it doesn't cost us anything just to keep it. If we don't talk about it, we just, if it's not an issue, just don't talk about it. We move on. And that way the town doesn't incur another cost. I think we, I think we need to explain to them what we propose to do, that we're going to drop it, and here's the ramifications of that rather than just drop it and say, oh, and by the way, bloody bloody, you know, you owe money. Yeah, I, I don't have any problem with giving them sort of one final warning, but we've already talked about it more than we should have tonight. Yeah. And we probably shouldn't waste another minute on it. Right, exactly. Yeah. So if it's the board's pleasure, I'll, I'll, I'll drop them a letter. Right. Tell them that if they don't come forward by next month, uh, we'll drop it and they'll have to reapply. Right. Is that a little okay, okay with the rest of the board? Dr. Chapman, do you want to weigh in on this? That's, that sounds fine. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, new business. Um, the two requests of David Ginn, 5 C Barn Road have been withdrawn. So those are off the agenda. Um, next item on the agenda is, is to hear the appeal of Kevin and Lisa Hutman. If you'd like to go forward with that, we can. If you want, we can skip over and go on to the next item and see whether Mr. LaPlante shows up. We'd like to go forward tonight. Okay. Well, then let's go ahead with that. Um, the item on the agenda is to hear the appeal of Kevin L. and Lisa M. Hutman, 10 Prout Place, tax map U53, lot 33C, for a right side property line variance of three feet from the required 30 feet to construct an attached garage. This is an after the fact variance application to correct an existing setback violation. And Mr. Jones, if you would identify yourself for us from the microphone, we'd appreciate it. My name is David Jones. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm representing uh, Kevin and Lisa Hutman tonight. Uh, the Hutmans send their greetings and apologies that they're not able to be here tonight. Uh, they're in the process of moving and in, in fact are out of state tonight. Uh, the property is under contract and this problem came to light as part of the title search and the plot plan uh, being done on the property uh, in connection with the sale. And uh, when this problem came to light uh, in talking with the code enforcement officer, he recommended that, that this is uh, one avenue uh, to be pursued. Um, we've submitted a fairly extensive application to you, but I, I have some supplemental materials I'd like to pass out to you uh, at this time if I could. Please do. Thank 
you. Thank you. Also here tonight and, and interested in uh, addressing the board are John Whipple, the architect who designed the house on this property, and Craig Cooper, the builder. Um, the, the chart that I've passed out is simply a summary of uh, information from the tax cards that we uh, included as part of the application. Under your, uh, the variance section of your ordinance, you require that the applicant show that there are at least 10 uh, other properties that are uh, similar to or similarly situated to the property in question uh, and that a variance is needed in order uh, to uh, allow uh, this property owner to enjoy their property in the same manner uh, that these 10 other property owners do. I thought this would be helpful just to show that the house that was constructed on this property is not out of line with or, or uh, significantly different in footprint than the uh, houses that are on the uh, 11 or 12 uh, comparable uh, properties that we submitted to you. In the same general area, if not on the same street or opposite side of the street, uh, there are houses uh, that are very similar or larger in size than the, the one that is uh, here. And so the need for a variance is not the result of having uh, built an excessively large house for the neighborhood in which the property is located. The subject property that we're talking about is map U53, lot 33C, which according to the tax card has a, uh, a uh, footprint uh, area of uh, 2,736 feet. And you can see from all the comparables that that is uh, pretty much in line with, if not a little smaller than a lot of the other houses uh, that are right in that general locality. The second thing that uh, I've passed out to you tonight was additional information uh, that, that was found since the time of our submittal. Uh, and the first is a uh, letter from the town to Gordon Duckett dated April 30th, 1993, uh, which shows that the planning board uh, amended the um, uh, building envelope for the adjacent lot uh, to reduce the setback from 30 feet to 24 feet. Uh, we think that's significant because it shows that, again, comparing this property to the neighboring properties, uh, we're not asking, uh, in terms of this variance, for something uh, that uh, uh, would uh, be inconsistent with the neighborhood or show that this property owner is trying to do something that, that the neighbors uh, would not be able to do. Um, and finally, uh, uh, we've also submitted um, a, a copy of a, uh, a zoning board agenda and the chart showing the zoning board actions for 1995 uh, and showing that the property at Five Park Circle, uh, which is uh, in the same development as this property uh, that we're talking about tonight, uh, that that also uh, came before the board back in 1995 for an after the fact variance uh, because they had a two foot setback violation for their uh, 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 dwelling and a 17 foot, uh, or actually I guess a 13 foot violation. They were seeking a 17 foot setback from the property line for their deck. Um, so this is, this is the, the kind of situation that uh, uh, has come up before, has been dealt with by the board and I understand that the, st the standards for a variance now are different than they were in 1995. But uh, this is, it indicates, I think, that, that a variance, an after-the-fact variance, has been granted in the town. The standard uh, for a variance back in 1995, in, in my opinion, was even more rigid uh, than the standard is today. Uh, back then, there was a requirement that there be a showing that the land could not yield a reasonable return whereas your standards today require an applicant simply to show that, uh, that uh, strict compliance with the ordinance would prevent them from enjoying the property for a lawful use in the same manner that other properties in the, in the locality are using their properties. So I, I think there's precedent for a variance for this type of 
after the fact uh, remedy. Um, turning specifically to, to this property, uh, uh, we've submitted a survey that shows that uh, uh, the uh, actual location of the rear of the garage is uh, about 27, I think it's 27.4 feet uh, from the property line, as opposed to the required 30 feet from the property line. Um, I, I think Mr. Cooper will, will address the um, efforts that were made or the care that was taken uh, to comply with the ordinance. And, um, um, in, in support of uh, our position that uh, um, this uh, violation uh, of the uh, strict setback requirement was entirely unintentional and, and occurred despite uh, reasonable efforts to avoid uh, any problem. Uh, but as you see from the map, these are very narrow, uh, almost uh, spaghetti-shaped lots, this one in particular, and, and a couple on the same, uh, adjacent to it. And um, the, apparently, from what I understand, the monumentation was difficult to locate. They did attempt uh, as best they could to uh, assure that they were meeting the requirements. Um, and um, uh, simply through misfortune, um, wound up with a, uh, a slight violation. Um, in terms of the other criteria that you that you uh, you have under your ordinance, um, I think the uh, uh, there is precedent for an after the fact variance when the when the actual placement of the structure um, is uh, is in uh, nonconformance. Uh, there is certainly no detriment to any surrounding property uh, as a result of this. Uh, in fact, the neighbor. Uh, whose property line uh, the uh, uh, the back of the garage uh, 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 faces uh, has written a letter indicating that she supports this application. Uh, also, we have a letter from a surveyor indicating that uh, the structure on the opposite side of this boundary line is 42 feet away from the boundary line. So it's not as though we have two structures that are at the minimal distance and, and we're seeking to make them closer. Um, the, the alternatives that the property owner would face in the absence of a variance uh, are simply um, not really feasible. Um, one would be removal of the back of the building, removal of a concrete foundation, I assume, that is underneath it or in the alternative, uh, relocating the property line and going back to the planning board for amended approvals. And uh, I think that in light of the very minor nature of the setback and the, the absence of any real detriment uh, to any other property, uh, that it would be reasonable for the board to grant this variance. Um, and with your leave, I'd like to ask Craig Cooper to uh, uh, just uh, speak a bit as to um, uh, his, uh, what he may have for input and, and from the perspective of the builder, uh, an explanation of uh, what efforts were made to avoid this problem and, uh, uh, and to request your assistance in solving it. Mr. Jones, yes. two things before you leave the podium. Um, I'm not sure if you did, I missed it, um, that you identified your office address for us for the record, if you would do that. My office address is 11 Main Street, Suite 4, Kennebunk, Maine, 04043. Okay, thank you. And if you would, you made reference to um, something in our ordinance that um, seemed to permit an after-the-fact variance. Well, what I'm saying is there's precedent in 1995 the zoning board did grant an after-the-fact variance, and, and I've provided uh, that information to you tonight. Um, that uh, was the uh, uh, the property at Five Park Circle, where uh, the records that, that uh, were located indicate that uh, 
on April 25, 1995, and after the fact, variance was granted for the property at uh, map U54, lot 15C. And my reference to your ordinance is that, I'll, is that your, your ordinance had a different criteria back in 1995 than it does today, that there were, there's a different set of standards. But having read them, I believe the standards in 1995 were more difficult to meet for variance than, they, than the standards that you have today. And so, although I, I'm not saying that your ordinance today specifically addresses after the fact variances, uh, what I meant to say is that there is precedent here in Cape Elizabeth for the granting of an after the fact variance. And I don't think the change in your ordinance raised the standard. I think it, it may have uh, made it a little easier to me. Bruce, do we know that the uh, variance for five park circle uh, was granted? Yeah, the, yeah, there's a chat that he submitted. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. We have the agenda from that meeting. It's this, uh, this right. sheet of paper. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. My name is Craig Cooper. I own Rainbow Construction. I'm the builder of the Hutman's home. And when I last stood before this board, I was here for a variance of my own with a 29-page application, which the board flattered me by asking if they could use it as an example in the future for people to come prepared. Tonight, instead of a 29-page application, I come before you somewhat with my hat in my hand and admitting that, as I've, that apparently, due to the most recent surveys, it appears that even though my A-type personality doesn't like to say this, I must have made a human error four years ago. I did, in fact, make every effort to try to locate this house. And as from what you have before you, and I'm just showing you a simple plot plan here, the 30-foot setbacks on this lot, it's not by error but actually by design that the architect, John Whipple, designed a house that would fit within this building envelope, which is very typical of people wanting to build homes where there are setbacks. We have a two and a half acre parcel here with, because of its shape, a pretty small building envelope, even though it was a 2,700 square foot footprint. It was specifically intended for the side of the garage to line up. As you, as, as the plot plans you have, the garage should have, and we thought, certainly I thought, that it had paralleled the building envelope on that side and then two points to the front of the house, taking into account the sun, the compass, you know, for morning light into the customer's kitchen and breakfast room, and the type of things that we design houses for people for at all times. I cannot honestly tell you and that I can recall 100% today what four and a half years ago I found when we walked through the fields, and I say, John Whipple and I, the architect, will speak to you, I believe, after myself. We did find some stakes, whether it was a steel bar with a cap or a stake noted the backside of this lot um, in this development is where the septic systems are required for this uh, development, which I know that uh, Skip Murray has recently worked on and repaired, and a lot of that's been torn up. So I don't know if anything back there could be found once again. But I recall John and I going out there and very carefully driving stakes, checking squares, we put strings up, we locate the house to show the customer that. There were several plans that were gone through, all of which fit within the building envelope. And then offsets were taken for those from those areas. And the process is then that a hole is dug, uh, excavator digs that hole, rechecks those off at offsets, a foundation crew comes in, sets the footing within that hole, sets the walls within that holes. We've given them a benchmark for the top of wall. And as everything was checked and rechecked, it appeared to be that we were, as planned, virtually right on that line. And, and to my re recollection, and John can verify this, um, I believe, knowing that there was a 30-foot setback there, we, tr we thought that we had located this house so that, in fact, the overhang of the house on that side lined up within that. And uh, we're taking that into account. It is the opposite of this building, this envelope side, the other variants on um, that was discussed, was granted before the house was completed for six feet, where the customer 
was granted a six foot variance to reduce that setback from 20, from 30 to 24, which would be to the left of the Hutman's house as you face it from the road. This issue is we've actually apparently set the house slightly over setback on the right hand side to where it's actually closer to 27 and a half feet back from their property line rather than the 30, which this setback requires. I am presently building homes in Cross Hill, as several of you know, which is within a quarter of a mile of here, we have a subdivision with 90 house lots on it where the setbacks are all 20 feet. I don't discount the fact that this subdivision required 30 foot setbacks. And I will tell you, we thought we had made every effort to it and found what we thought was enough information to be able to do so. Clearly, we've been proven that that is not the case tonight. We stand before you asking your indulgence on granting something similar that has happened elsewhere within the neighborhood. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Greg, what's the, the dashed line that runs along and slightly divergent from the property line in this drawing? The right hand side. On this smaller plan or on your large? I'm looking at the larger drawing here. My sure. I believe that, that is showing the neighbor's driveway. The neighbor's driveway is, in fact, as, as you may or may not know, while, property, by, while building envelopes require that the footprint of the building remain within the building envelope, the driveway can, in fact, abut okay, so the driveway. Driveway. And, that, and that neighbor's driveway is, in fact, right along that line. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, I somewhat recall that we probably did some measuring based on that as well. Was this house placed first or was the adjacent Finley property? This was the, one of the last lots to be sold in there, in fact. Um, and so, you know, the, the two other houses were there prior to this. Other questions? When Mr. did you Cooper? complete construction? When did we complete construction? Um, uh, approximately. 90, it was 98. It was four years ago. I think it was in the... It took about seven months to build the house. Went through the, through the winter, I believe, in early spring. They moved in in the summer, as I recall. And both houses on either side were in... Were place. completed at that time. Thank you. Actually, they were complete. They were completed prior to our even starting. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Cooper? Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. I'm John Whipple, I was the architect, and I don't have much to add to Craig's account. Um, I'm sorry, I missed your last name. John Whipple. Whipple? Yeah. And um, your architect for this address? Um, 47 Thomas Street in Portland. Thank you, Mr. Whipple. Um, this came as a surprise to me, uh, to both of us. I think we didn't think there was an issue. I looked up the site plans that we had done. We did three of them, and they all fit. Um, I don't remember any more than standing out there with Craig putting in the stakes and thinking it was pretty, um, pretty comfortable fit, including the overhangs. So it was a surprise, an uh, uh, unintentional error. Any questions? Yes. I'll address this to you. Maybe you can answer this. On the survey, there's a notation, view easement line behind the house. And, and I ask this in view of the fact that Cape Elizabeth does not have a view easement per se. Do you know what this refers to? You may not be the one to answer that. No. It's a, um... But since our ordinance does not address that, I didn't know if you were aware of maybe this is a subdivision restriction or... Is that a new survey that you're looking at? Which survey are you looking at? This, this is the survey that was included in 2002. Uh, I, I don't know the history. Would that be a subdivision specific restriction possibly or deed restriction or do you? Could be either. I, I don't know. Uh, 
Now, the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust does have a conservation easement, I believe, in this area, and this may be what we're talking about. If you look at the line above it, this conservation easement line down below it says view easement line. They're probably one in the same. Formally, it's a conservation easement, and I, and I believe it's one of the land trust. There, I, I have a copy of the Hutman's uh, deed, which I think we may have included. If not, I apologize. There, uh, the, the conveyance of this lot was made subject to conditions A through L. Uh, so there were a lot of easements and, and other restrictions. And uh, one item is a conservation easement and view easement as shown on the plan. Uh, and certain pedestrian vehicular access and related rights as set forth in an easement deed uh, between the Kaferi Wine Check uh, and the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust. So the developer um, apparently had a, a prior agreement with the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust that dedicated a view easement, and that showed the location of that. There was also a grant of apparently the right for the land trust to go onto that area and maintain the conservation and view easement. It, as far as you know, does this encroachment have any bearing on this view easement? No, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't. But generally, in reading a plan, the view easement would show the, would delineate the area uh, in which you are not allowed to place obstructions of the view. And so that would be in the area in, in back of the house where you would not be allowed to obstruct the view. It wouldn't be going toward the street. I'm not sure. I, I haven't been out there, so I don't know what it is you can see. But there must be a nice vista. If I may, I'll be I mean, it's not a bad view into the back over the, over the swamp. This is the lot in question, on lot 33. And the view easement line, this is the, the development in total. The view easement line appears to run here. And that's consistent with what you have on your survey lot, where you, with the recent survey where you see this. This is the building envelope. And the, and the area where we're affecting is here, off to the side. Or it is several hundred feet back from the actual view easement. And this is the two and a half acre parcel with the and this hill, it crowns up so the customer requested the house to be built right at the top of this hill for the obvious reason where everybody has really built at the back of their lots, one, to stay away from the road, and two, to take advantage of that view. Thank you. That concludes our presentation. And we obviously would uh, appreciate very much your favorable consideration of this application. Yes. yes By all means. What you stated that this became an issue with the mortgage survey, is that correct? That's right. What, what could you explain to the board what impact that would be to the mortgage holder and, and in what way that would impact the the mortgage company and mortgage holder. Well, when a uh, when a uh, property uh, is uh, sold, generally the lender requires title insurance and requires that uh, matters relating to survey, which are normally accepted from title coverage, be covered. In other words, that the, the standard survey exception be deleted from the lender's policy so that if there are defects that a survey would reveal, uh, the lender is protected by the title insurance company against any loss that might arise as a result of that problem. Um, and in order to give that type of insurance coverage, the title insurance company asks that uh, a mortgage loan inspection plan be done, which is a pretty rough uh, tape measure job uh, to go out and just verify that the building does meet the setback requirements. Believe it or not, you sometimes find that the building isn't even on the lot that you thought it was on. Sometimes those inspections discover some really significant errors. But they also turn up many minor problems, like these setback violations. So um, the title insurance company, in a case like this, would take an exception and say, we will not protect the mortgage holder against any loss arising from this particular setback violation. 
that generally makes the mortgage holder back off and refuse to grant the mortgage because that type of exception might prevent the mortgage from being sold on the secondary mortgage market. So the whole process grinds to a halt to try to resolve that problem. The first step, really, when you have a mortgage inspection plan come back with this type of a minor problem is to send a surveyor out there to do a full instrument survey to verify that, in fact, there is a problem because the first go at it is, is very rough. In this case, the Owen Haskell Company did go out and do a full instrument survey and verified that, in fact, the overhang is only 27.4 feet and the corner boards are 28 point something feet from the property line. So this violation is, is one that the title insurance company um, would note in their title policy and uh, generally uh, the mortgage, the, the lender would, uh, would want to see this cleared up to their satisfaction before they would grant a mortgage on the property. What other alternatives are available to you if the variance is not granted? Um, one alternative would be to go to the town council and uh, ask that, uh, in effect, that the Hutmans be prosecuted for a land use violation and that uh, the prosecution not require them to remove the, the, the building, but that there be some other resolution of that prosecution. Um, and, and then the other two alternatives that I mentioned were uh, to remove part of the building uh, or to try to move the property line. Um, and when you say move the property line, meaning acquire three feet? Acquire, acquire additional land from the abutter. Uh, and um, that, I assume, would require going back before the planning board because you'd be amending an approved subdivision plan. So it's, 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 quite, a, it's quite a painful process, uh, whichever way you go. Um, and from my experience, different towns handle this type of problem in different ways. This is not a, an unusual problem. Um, many, many times these mortgage loan inspection plans show that, uh, that there were uh, violations. And um, in terms of how this should be handled or how this board should, should handle it, I, I would simply point to precedent that, in fact, the zoning board in this town in the past has granted after the fact variances to, to uh, uh, remedy a, a zoning violation. And, and uh, with that precedent, I think it would be appropriate for this board to uh, consider you know, granting this application. I don't mean for my question to imply anything, but has the town ever denied an after the fact zoning variance? Let's see um, to the best of my knowledge, um, I, I can't say one way or the other. I, I want to say no because that implies I have some knowledge of it. I really don't know um, uh, whether the, the this zoning board has, has ever denied one. Uh, Perhaps the code enforcement officer, or someone else uh, who's got you know more history here in the town than I do, um, might know. I'd like to have. But what I have, what I have heard or been told is that no one has ever gone to the town council with a a uh, land use violation situation like this, where you were talking about it, an after the fact discovery of a minor encroachment. Bruce, has there ever been a denial of the? fact variance request based on this kind of uh, error? In the five years I've been here, the the, the ones that I'm familiar with, uh, I don't recall that, um, that there was one denied. The simple fact that since I've been here, there's been no consent agreements through the town council would lead one to believe that. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it right or wrong, but. No, I just, I, I didn't want to imply anything with my question either. Just to get the information out of the table. Well, in the five years you've been here, do you know of any that have been granted? I'd have to, I'd have to look back. I suspect there's been a couple. I'm, I'm not sure how many, but generally speaking, the, the board has, has looked, on, uh, looked at situations like this to, to be 
not necessarily a big deal and have granted it even though they may, may or may not have met the standards. I guess, you know, my, my concern is from sort of a town precedent standpoint, um, I know that in, we have the reference to the after the fact variance that was granted down the street from this property at Five Park Circle. Um, I don't know what the status of the, I mean, I know what the status of the ordinance was at that time. It was the undue hardship standard as opposed to the practical difficulty standard. And I agree with you that the practical difficulty standard is a more lenient standard for granting a variance than the undue hardship standard. Um, I don't know what the law was at that time with regard to granting an after the fact variance. Um, I did take a look at, only because we had this issue come up before us a couple of years ago, in sort of a different format. The um, uh, Roe versus City of South Portland case from 1999, where I'm sure you know the Supreme Judicial Court took a very harsh stand on a violation that was even smaller than the one we have before us tonight. It was admittedly under the undue hardship standard, but at least they discussed the considerations in and after the fact variance, and they made it clear that um, the same requirements and analysis applied to uh, post-construction cases as applied to pre-construction cases. And they, uh, as part of their analysis, they made it clear that the costs of remedying it, the, uh, the encroachment, even if prohibitive, um, were not reasons to grant the variance. Um, it was a very harsh result. I don't know how that case was finally resolved, and maybe you do. I don't. Um, <clears throat> but I, I think that if this, if the property owner came to us before the house was built and asked for a variance when it was clear that the house could have fit within the dimensional standards required, I think it's probably fair to say that the board would have denied the variance you know, at that time. So we're being asked after the fact to look at it differently when the law seems clear that we're supposed to look at it the same way. I think what I get concerned about is we're building on smaller and smaller parcels and depending on architects and builders to find those places to make sure that the you know, setbacks are correct and things like that. And you look at the shape of this lot and now I have this picture in front of me that's supposed to be accurate. And, and the, the, prior, the people who placed this on the lot thought they were being accurate. And I just have a concern about granting a variance after the fact, ba based on the fact that it could set a precedence that ripples through Cross Hill um, and many other developments that are happening in this area. Because we could have people coming here all the time going, I built a garage and it's just not in the right place. So that's what I get concerned about, is the ripple effect. I think as a board, we have to make a judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. I think a tough, tough thing that we have to look at, the single toughest criterion I see here is whether practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant for a prior owner. Hmm. And, and somehow, I think we have to factor into our consideration of that criterion whether or not we believe it was intentional or not. Too. And if we believe that it was an error all around, and I think that brings that criterion, uh, in my mind anyway, in view under one light. And if we believe that it may have been an intentional try to play some kind of an end game situation, then I might look at it differently. And that's the only criterion that I see might have some difficulty in these kinds of cases. And I don't, by my questions, mean to um, imply that there's any, that there was any intent or evil motive here. I think it was clear that it was an accident and that the 
builder and architect come to us with hat in hands and are embarrassed by it. I understand that. I don't think for a minute that anybody intended to try and uh, you know, skate by uh, and hope nobody would notice. Um, it's clearly oh, something that nobody intended there, to happen. Sure. And there, there's, I, I think there's also a question of, of the, one, the, the, the care or precaution that was taken to avoid the error. There's a, I think there's a difference between someone going out and carefully measuring three times and thinking they got it right versus someone who doesn't measure and comes in after the fact and says, I didn't mean to. Uh, I used to hear I didn't mean to from my kids all the time, and that wasn't really a very good excuse because they, you know, they were careless. In this case, uh, there, there was no lack of care or attention. Um, but as, as Craig said, uh, humans make errors. Um, in terms of in terms of setting a, a precedent, this this situation, despite the best efforts of, of builders and surveyors and so forth, is is going to happen from time to time. And in fact, you will have older homes in this town that were built before plot plans and surveys and so forth were ever required, that are now being surveyed, and you will find from time to time that there's a house that was built that was a little too close to the line one way or the other. And the question then becomes, how is that handled? As a practical matter, you don't require people to tear down their houses. Um, and different towns handle it differently. And uh, when, when uh, we checked with uh, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, we found that there was some precedent here in the, in the town for after the fact variances. There was no precedent for uh, going before the town council for consent decrees and, and things of that nature. And now, you know, I have to grant you that if, uh, if I were arguing to the justices of the Maine Supreme Court, you know, they, they might say, you know, in South Portland, it isn't done this way. And I, I can't argue with that. Uh, but there is precedent here in Cape Elizabeth. This, this, is, a, this is a very minor, unintentional uh, setback violation. And uh, it, it needs to be remedied in some way. Uh, a, a variance is one way that it can be done and appears to be the way that it's been handled in the past year in town. Um, if it's, you know, if, if, if it's the desire of this board to, to set a, a, a new precedent that says from this date forward, you know, no after the fact variances will be granted, then uh, you know, I, I think uh, people in, in town will find uh, other ways to go about trying to resolve these problems. But these problems will come up from time to time. And we're asking, I'm asking, and, and I think other people will ask, that there be a practical solution provided in the town rather than an impractical difficulty uh, 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 thrown at people when, when these unintentional you know, minor mistakes do happen. <clears throat> Uh, this problem was identified because of the mortgage survey. If, if these people had not have sold the property, a mortgage survey would not have been triggered and, and this would not have come to light. Mr. Smith, in view of the fact that the town would not have been aware of this without the mortgage survey, now that the, we are aware of this, or the town is, is this an issue simply from a mortgage standpoint, or is there any town issue uh, related to this encroachment at this time? If, if, if the mortgage is completely out of the picture, is this relevant to the town at this time? It's a violation that's been brought to my attention that, that would need to be corrected one way or another. Um, it would be what? It, it's a violation that has been brought to my attention that will need to be straightened out and corrected. Whether that be consent agreement, planning so board, not, or at this point, it's not simply the mortgage that we're, uh, issue. It's it's it, it, it's an issue that needs to be corrected somewhat. When the app, the applicant will have to exhaust all possibilities. If you know, and and the last result would be to re remove the that part in violation. Yes, the town would have to carry this through, or my office would.
Well, from the uh, code enforcement officer's standpoint, is it uh, the zoning board of appeals or is it the planning board that is the proper venue to resolve this? That's up to the 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 uh, owners to decide. Uh, you know, I can give them the options, and and they can decide. They have every right to take it to the board of appeals. Although another remedy would go back be back to go to the back to the planning board to get a lot line change, um, or to the council for consent agreement. All them options are out there. Um, I just give them the options, and they they choose to take what action they feel appropriate at that point. I agree with what Mr. Jones is saying about sort of the practical resolution, um, sort of what's the easy way to resolve a problem. And probably the easiest way for us to resolve it is for this board to grant the request. But I'm not sure this is the right board to grant the request. Um, I mean, I think that for this board to grant the request, we've got to ignore the ordinance. Well, this is the only board that can grant a variance. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. I, I realize that, but I'm just wondering if there's a resolution other than a variance. I, I did advise the applicants that, that um, they could go to the town manager and, and, and ask for a consent agreement, but that the, probably the town manager would, would go back to that person and say, you need to exhaust other avenues before you come to us. Um, meaning if the board denies you and you, and, you, and you don't have any success with the planning board, which we really didn't talk about the planning board too much, uh, then, then come to me and we'll, we'll talk at that point. But I believe it, it, it was town manager who in through his our conversation, I believe that's what he wanted. He wanted to make sure everything else was, was exhausted. Not to say that that, that that his board was going to grant, or you know, he wasn't making a decision whether his grant board would grant or deny. He just said that it needs to go through the, the process. I mean, there has to be a resolution of this, short of tearing off three feet of the house. That obviously makes no sense, and that's not something that anybody considers as the right way to cure and there was a, and there was a third option um, for a reduction for a, a building envelope change through the plan board as as was the case for the next door neighbor but that option went out the window with the Perkins case in the Gunquit where it, where they basically said that plan boards could not waive setbacks planning board if they create a building envelope that's 35 feet from the property line in a particular district is it setback is 30 they could grant down to the 30 but below the required setback the Perkins case basically said that they can't waive those standards that's a variance issue that the only the Board of Appeals could do so that that option's gone but the property line change uh, could happen so this this good and Beckett case is that, is that what you're referring to this could not be done today Planning board could not pass an amendment to the subdivision. Right. They couldn't. They can't waive standards to less than required setback. That's a board of appeals. This could not happen today. It only could happen if the envelope was over the required setback, and they could well, kind of wave it down to the setback. They reduced required it to 24 district. feet from 30 feet. And the setback for that district is 30. So no, that it application could not, could not happen. Nor could this, as as a setback reduction. So that would not be an option for the applicant to take it for the planning board the same kind of request? That, no. It would be an option to take it to the planning board for the minimum change to a property line, um, which, you know, they could, they could entertain. So there is, there is a remedy before the planning board? Well, the planning board can't change the property line un until the neighbor conveys ownership and gets a release from the neighbor's mortgage. Do we even know if the neighbor has any land without violating their own setback? Yeah, that, yes. that's right there. That's they, what I was concerned about. So then in that case, we have a situation where they're 
driveway and I'm nailed to the property. How close is their house to that property line? 42 feet. But their driveway runs right up the property line? Mm -hmm. It's shown that was the dotted line that Mr. Keneally was asking about. Can't that be a right of way? Which is less expensive to build a garage or a driveway? I have two questions for Mr. Smith. I, should I delay that? No, go ahead. As code enforcement officer, you typically have the ability to reduce sideline setbacks from 30 feet to 25 feet. Why is that not applicable in this particular situation? It's it's only in the audience for non-conforming lots of record. That is record lots that are either smaller in size or smaller in, or, or less frontage than, than, than required for the district. Thank you. I, I wanted that for the record. And the, the second question is, uh, you, you view the, I noticed on this boundary survey that they show two, two dimensions, one from the overhang and one from the corner board. Uh, you measure setbacks or building envelope uh, uh, based on the foundation, which would be more represented by the corner board. Is that correct? The ordinance define setbacks as being that measurement to the foundation. Okay, so in, according to the survey, the corner board is 28 feet 6 inches from the property line. So we're indeed talking about a foot and a half encroachment. Is that correct? Instead of 2 feet 8 inches, we're talking about 1 foot 6 inches. Yes. So you, you, you are not concerned about an overhang. Well, the definition of the setback. No, I'm not, because the definition is uh, defined as the setback being measured to the foundation wall. Okay. So we're indeed talking about a foot and a half encroachment. Unless it's a cantilevered situation, and then it's to the can. Sorry. Unless it's a cantilevered situation, and then it's to the cantilever. But it doesn't include the overhang, the typical overhang. And and that so that would apply in this situation also. Correct. Okay. So for the, for the record then, we are talking about a foot and a half encroachment and not an almost three foot encroachment. It's still an encroachment. It's still in violation, but it's a, a smaller violation apparently. And, and maybe splitting hairs, but if I go to the foundation, the corner board is a good inch and a half up beyond the foundation. Well, I'd... Well, it's even less. I mean, I just wish it closer. <laughs> okay. Other questions for Mr. Jones? Anybody? Thank you, Mr. Jones. Is there anybody else here who would like to speak either in favor of or in opposition to this request? Okay, well, that will close the public comment portion of the hearing and open it for discussion among board members. I believe it's an inadvertent error, um, and a very small error at that. And primarily for those reasons, I'm prepared to support the application for the variance. Comments from anybody else? I agree with that largely. I think that um, Mr. Cooper is an exceptional builder. He's built a lot of homes in Cape Elizabeth and properties, expansions. We don't see him here as a routine customer, um, which is good. It, it shows that he this isn't something that that gets by him often. I don't think this is something we need to worry about for the future. And I don't see this as setting bad precedent with Mr. Cooper. So I'm in support of this. Based on those reasons. Dr. Shepmas. Based on this site plan where the house is clearly showed not at the building envelope, but clearly within the building envelope, it's my feeling that this is a, 
an oversight that is certainly unintentional. I think if, that the house, based on the configuration, could have been rotated slightly to correct the foot and a half, that it is encroaching on the setback. And it's my, it, it's apparent to me that this is an unintentional uh, error uh, based on at time of construction. I agree with that. I think that they didn't gain anything from this. It's, they didn't get a better view. They didn't get more square footage. They could have done it differently had they known. They probably gained a headache. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. No, they didn't, they didn't gain anything. This wasn't a, this benefit, this didn't have any benefit to them. This, no, I, it was a headache at this that point. That was my point because yeah. the, in, in the building stage, the, the, the garage could have been shifted or the house could have been rotated to, to accommodate it. I, I, I couldn't see any benefit at all, I agree with you, for, for going outside the building, building envelope by foot and a half prior to construction, intentionally. I see no benefit in that. So it's, it's my feeling that as the builder stated, uh, he made a best effort to, to abide by the ordinance. And goofy. A little bit. Well, in order to avoid what would clearly be, I think, an unjust result and to avoid the agony of having to go through some other process to obtain the result which should ultimately be obtained. Although, I think I'm going to have to ignore some of the obvious terms of the ordinance to come to the conclusion. I'm going to support the application. Um, the fact that it's, that it's Mr. Cooper as opposed to another builder is, has nothing to do with it. Obviously does have a great reputation you know, within CAPE, but to me that's not relevant to to the actual decision as much as it is the reality of the hardship to the property, the property <laughs> owner, um, in trying to get this resolved. It is de minimis. Um, it clearly was unintentional. Um, I think it flies in the face of the notion that if we were to apply the same standard after the fact that we're supposed to apply before construction, we wouldn't be reaching this result. We'd tell them to build the house within the property line setbacks and there's no need for a variance. Now after the fact, we're actually applying a different standard, um, which is not what the ordinance and not what, not what the Supreme Court tell, tells us that we're supposed to do. Um, but again, it seems to be somewhat of an exercise in futility to say no only to then force them to come back to the town in front of a different body to achieve the same result um, and incur additional expense when we could resolve it here tonight. So for that reason, and I think somewhat reluctantly, um, you know, I'm willing to support it. And, I, and I'd like to just say one thing. I mean, I want to see this go through. But I think this is exactly the exact reason why there's never been a consent agreement with the town council, because the board has saw this as not a big issue and have disregarded the criteria that was, has to be met as a judicial board for review. And I, I don't want to be harsh here. I just want to point out to the board that, that you need to look at you, I want to remind you that you have to look at the hardship or the practical difficulty for any variance. And, and if, if, if you feel that those standards are met, then so be it. Uh, if they're not met, you, have a, you do have an obligation. And, I, and I, I don't want to put this application in jeopardy. I just, this argument I've set in many board members' meetings with four different towns, and this argument is the same argument that I hear over and over again. Um, they overlook the standards to take care of a problem because it's not going to be a big deal. And I just want to point out that in my eyes, that's not the right way to do it. And I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> uh, 
the only way I can prove it, Bruce, and I, and I am going to vote to approve it, is that uh, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I'm interpreting that to mean that the practical difficulty is not the result of action knowingly taken by the applicant or prior owner. And but where, where are the ten, the majority of the ten nearest uh, at, at, at a location less than the 30 feet? Big Brian? One of the the standards is that you have to have a like in size and a like in a distance to property lines or in, in its location. Well, that, you yeah, don't that, have ten you don't have the majority of the nearest you know, ten. In terms of just looking at the basic eight conclusions here and the wording of those. I, I mean I, I want these people to get what, what they need to clear this up. I'm just I, I just get frustrated because I think we all believe it was an unintentional error. Uh, there was, I've heard the as, argument. As Mrs. Miller pointed out, there was, I believe it was you, that there was no gain to the applicant from the error. There was no reason at all to believe that it was an intentional error. And it's, it's one foot, four and a half inches, very tiny error. I just want to point out the obligations of the board. Right. And Bruce, I agree with you. I mean, that's sort of part of my struggle here, because I think that uh, under a strict reading of the ordinance, we should deny this. Well, I think you have an obligation as a judicial board to, to look at the criteria and make sure it's met, whether it's well, a fact of the board. I, I understand, and that's why I sort of explained the dilemma that I feel, you know, we're in with this. Um, it's also balancing the practicalities of the result and sort of what their next step is from here and looking at the, the real consequences of our decisions. And we can certainly make a decision based on the literal, the strict reading of the ordinance and I understand that that's probably in the abstract the right thing to do. But, you know, there's a common sense element that needs to be weighed in and despite the fact that I think under the terms of the ordinance they're not entitled to it, um, common sense says they should have it. And it's not because I read this as, as Jack does, that the practical difficulty is not the result of knowing action taken by the applicant. The word knowing isn't in there. I don't think it's a question of knowing or unknowing. I don't think that's one of the elements, but I'm just looking at it from a common sense standpoint. But I, I respect your I, comments, and I think I'm only frustrated because I think they're appropriate, and I think we should over, hear that. Over, this happens over and over again, and and I and I just think it's it's, it's it. There should be another remedy for the applicant through I I believe through a consent agreement. I believe that's the way to handle it. I think that's the appropriate way. The town recognizes the, the fact that there is a violation, and they let it go through through whatever monetary fine, no monetary fine. And, and, and it's a legal issue. If, if what you decide tonight if it doesn't meet the standards, not that anybody's going to challenge it, but it, if it was challenged, it would be overturned in a higher court, unless, unless you could prove that each one of the elements are met. And, and I don't want to belabor this. I want this to happen, but I just get frustrated with, with the fact that these, it's the wrong board to be, it's the wrong way to be doing these after facts. I feel strongly about that. So that said, oh, I will shut up this time. <laughs> Anybody want to change their position in light of Mr. Smith's comments? Well, I, I and they're all well taken. Yeah, I'm of the. It's it's really difficult for me because it does seem like such a small, you know, a foot and whatever. But I, I'm having a real struggle that it, I can't vote on, I don't know how to vote on these elements because I don't think it, I personally can't support it at this point, I guess, even though it is like a foot and whatever. And that's a tough struggle for me because it is a common sense thing. I go to the common sense piece. When is the closing supposed to be? go on. When is the closing scheduled for? And, and if anybody's going to answer that, would they please come up to the podium so we don't deny our fast listening audience the benefit 
this is sweeps week, and we want to make sure everybody can hear. <laughs> but the closing's been delayed. It won't happen until this is resolved. Okay, but is, is it going? Will it happen as soon as this is, or is it scheduled for a period after? It'll happen Monday if, if the vote is favorable. What I was thinking is if we if we made a conditional um, vote based on going to see what, what the town would do with a consent agreement, but that'll delay things further. Well, I don't think it's the wrong result for something to be delayed. Closing well, doesn't have to take What I was thinking is if we, we table it or um, not deny it and suggest they go to the town for the consent agreement and then seeing how that turns out, then reconsider. And that way he's giving, kind of starting the precedent that the town gives uh, these I believe the town. I believe the town manager will, will, will only bring it forth to the town council if indeed this board denies it on its merits. So we have to deny it? Can't we? I, that's my feeling, that that's what will, you know, I, I don't know. The manager may entertain that, but I, I got the feeling that, that, that uh, the applicant has to exhaust all other remedies before that's last resort. Yeah, if, if certainly if we if we send it that way and say we, we don't think we're the appropriate body, it, it, he has come to us and he has exhausted this remedy and we're kind of saying it's, it's um, we lack jurisdiction almost. <clears throat> well, it's not a matter of lacking jurisdiction, it's just a matter of whether or not they meet the criteria of the ordinance. That's true. That's what it boils down to. Does it meet yep. the criteria? If it does, pass it. If it doesn't, then... Well, it's as black and white as that. I've always uh, reserved, the, uh, reserved the right to change my mind on things. And I've just changed mine. So I'm ready to go ahead and vote, but I'm going to vote against it. I think uh, Bruce has convinced me he's, he's right. I mean, my instincts initially were that it didn't meet the terms of the ordinance. Um, but I think if there's another remedy within the town to resolve it, that it ought to be done within the way that the town sees it appropriate to resolve it. Um, I'm convinced that the back of the garage is not going to be torn off, um, that there will be a resolution of it. But as I said before, to vote for it, I was going to have to ignore the terms of the ordinance. And um, Bruce has just convinced me that that's probably not the right thing to do. So again, Bruce, thank you for the comments. I think they're well, Bruce, well, well uh, intended, and and I take them that way. Bruce, I have a question. Yep. Would, would you restate again your concerns, please? Your your concerns that you stated a moment ago. Would you restate those again? I'm my concerns about this board granting. Yeah. I think it boils down to the, the board being a judicial board which, who is charged to, to look at the ordinance in its entirety and go down through the difficulty standards. And if the practical difficulty standards are met, whether it's after the fact or before, before that, 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 that you have an obligation to approve, that, they are, that it, it, it's black and white to me, that if practical difficulty standards aren't met, if it's after the fact or before, that the board has an obligation to, to uh, deny the application. I think it boils down to that simple fact. As much as I'd like to see this problem going away, I, I, it isn't this problem. It's, it's the overall message that the board sends out and has been sending out for years. We now have a new standard to go by. It's a good time to, to, to pay attention to what's before you. And, 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 and no matter what kind of precedent, whether right or wrong, preceded this meeting, I think it, it, this is the opportune time for the board to, to, to actually go by what's in front of them and, and, and do what needs to be done. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe it'll meet the elements. I don't know. I mean, you haven't gone through the elements, but I think you need to look at the elements and, and, find, and make a decision on each one of the elements and, and, and explain for the record how, they, how, the, how the elements have been met. And Let maybe muddy the water a little bit more then by bringing up yet another common sense uh, intent. And I just 
throw this out for as a simple observation. Uh, with 30 foot sideline setbacks, their intention in part was to keep houses in the subdivision from be being closer than 60 feet within each other. Is that is that a correct assumption? Uh, on the lot size lots within that development, yes, that's correct. Based on this boundary survey of 42 feet from 12 uh, Crouch Place uh, from the sideline setback and then 28 and a half feet foundation setback, we're talking about 70 feet, 70 and a half feet distance between the two houses more or less. Uh, 70 and a half being greater than 60. Now that's no justification uh, violation of, of the ordinance, but along that line it does in one view support the intent of the ordinance, and that is to keep houses from being closer to than 60 feet approximation of each other. And I'd just like to point that out. I, I agree with that, and I, I believe that this board is a quasi-judicial board, and as such, you know, this board does have the authority to interpret the regulations. There, there is uh, a definition of zoning board responsibilities and authorities in a book that I unfortunately didn't bring, the other book that sort of came to this, which lays that out fairly clearly in black and white. So I, I do not believe that, for instance, the interpretation that I put on here that practical difficulty is not the result of action knowingly taken. I don't think that's outside of the authority of the zoning board to make that kind of interpretation of that statement. I, I'm not arguing that point, Jack. Okay. And if the practical, like I said, if the practical difficulty standards are met, then then you have an obligation to to make a decision well, based on we, it. Or if they're not, primary obligation is, as Jay just said, you know, what's what's the intent of the body of zoning regulations? If and to expound on on my statement for what it's worth, if if twelve Crouch Place was 30 feet from the sideline, and this was 28 and a half, then it would be uh, a deviation from the intent, in my feeling. It's the houses are closer than 60 feet to each other. Uh, well, see, the applicant, on, the, the owner of the property on the other side has, has a right tomorrow to come in to get a permit to, to be at 30 feet with an addition. So, um, you know, th and, so just because it's today it's 42 feet doesn't mean it's not going to be 30 tomorrow. Um, I, I don't I don't want to argue this anymore. I, I myself I, I just wanted to point out that, that I feel that the board needs to look at the standards. That's all, and, and make a decision based on the standards. Okay. And I think the record should, should clearly state what the standards, what the decisions were. Well, let's go ahead and move forward on the standards and a vote on them. Um, by a show of hands, um, all those members of the board who find that there is no substantial departure uh, from the intent of the ordinance. And that is found in the affirmative. Five in favor, zero opposed. Um, a show of hands, those who find that a literal enforcement of the ordinance would cause a practical difficulty as defined by 30-A, Main Revised Statutes Annotated, Section 4353-4C. And the, a practical difficulty is defined in our ordinance as an occasion where the, where the strict application of the ordinance to a property precludes the ability of the property owner to pursue a use permitted in the zoning district in which the property is located and results in significant economic injury to the property owner. And significant economic injury is defined as placing the applicant for a variance at a disadvantage in the neighborhood by applying zoning ordinance standards which would prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of the other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. 
So again, a show of hands of all those who find that a literal enforcement would cause a practical difficulty. Opposed? And that is found three in favor, two opposed. Um, next, all those who find that the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general circumstances of the neighborhood. And that is found five in favor, zero opposed. Um, next, a show of hands of those who find that the granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the user market value of abutting properties. And that is found in the affirmative by a vote of five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, those who find that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. And opposed, um, that is found three in favor, two opposed. Uh, next, that there, uh, a show of hands of those who find that there is no other feasible alternative to a variance available to the petitioner uh, with no other feasible alternative defined in the ordinance as in the case of a variance request, there is no other place on the lot taking into consideration the physical constraints of the property or no other location on the structure that the proposed construction could go without the need for a variance without causing the owner to create other compliance problems on the lot because of the zoning ordinance, deed restrictions, or conditions imposed by a lease or contract. Um, so all those who find that there is no other feasible alternative to a variance available. And I need to mull that over. Can we talk about these, or are we? Um, sure. See, I was thinking about this one, and I was, no feasible alternative in my mind means that there's no, other than coming to us tonight, there's no alternatives. Now, the definition is a little bit different. The definition makes it sound like there's no feasible alternative on the lot versus feasible alternative in right. practicality. Um, I mean, I, I see there is the feasible alternative is there that the petitioner can go to the town for the consent agreement, and so. I'm, but that's um, that's but, not the definitional standard. Right, and that's my that's my quandary here. So I'm just kind of making sure that people are interpreting it as yeah. this on paper. I look at it that in initial construction there was a feasible alternative. Then I agree that. Now that it's a, you know, construction occurred, right. then you have to look at it. Is there a, another practical approach to solving the problem? But I think, um, as a matter of law, we're supposed to look at a post-construction. Well, it's clear that we're supposed to look at a post-construction variance the same way we look at a pre-construction variance. And yeah, I agree with that. So, um, so. Uh, again, all, by a show of hands, all those who find that there is no other feasible alternative to a variance um, available to the petitioner. And opposed? And that is found two in favor, three opposed. Um, next, by a show of hands, those who find that the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. And that is in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. And last, the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as described in Title 38, Section 435. And that is five in favor, zero opposed. And with those votes, um, could I have a motion from someone substantially as follows? Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals has found that the applicant has failed to meet the applicant's burden of proof 
in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-5-2B1 of the Cape Elizabeth, wait, I'm sorry, wrong one, um, 2B, oh wait, that's right, I'm sorry. Um, Whereas the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals has found that the applicant has failed to meet the applicant's burden of proof in establishing that all conditions specified in section 19-52B1 of the Cape Elizabeth Zoning Ordinance have been met. I move that the application for a variance of uh, the application for a right side property line variance of three feet from the required 30 feet to construct an attached garage um, as specified in the application of Kevin Allen, Lisa L. Hupman, 10 Prout Place, tax map U53, lot 33C, uh, be denied. Now bear in mind that this is something that we've gone through before when all of the elements have not been found in the affirmative, the obligation is to, not, to deny the overall motion or to deny the overall application. Um, if we don't find that all of the elements have been found in the affirmative, the, uh, the application can't be approved. And we have, we have a vote of two in favor, three opposed, as to the no feasible alternative standard. Do we, do we even need to vote on this at this time? Yeah, I'm kind of in favor of it. Well, I think we do. Well, what about just tabling it, not voting on this, knowing where we stand, and allowing them the opportunity then to go to the town, get the consent agreement, and if that doesn't work, or they, they can't come back, and just sending the message to the town that um, that we've considered it and we think it's the best avenue is the consent agreement. But doesn't I, taking action and voting accomplish that same thing? It does, but that's permanent. We can't, re we can't okay. come back. We can't okay. talk about this again. Okay. So it, it, it is permanent for them, they would lose the, us as an avenue. Okay. We could ask them too. So you're suggesting that we decline to act on the application? Right, based on the reason that we suggest they go to the town so that we send the message so that the town doesn't say to them when they come on tomorrow morning to the manager's door that we didn't act on it. I mean, we're sending the message that we're, we're sending them to the town because that's a better avenue so that they will have deemed it to be exhausting all remedy, exa exhausting this as a remedy. But will they have exhausted well, it's, I, anything we, if we haven't denied it? No, we, we're taking that chance. We don't know. Um, but they just, they would be, it'd be keeping the door open so that they could come back to us if that doesn't work. And it could be up to them. Let them think it over. The, the the elements, Won't if they're met or not met, though, um, defines the final vote. Absolutely. I agree. Period. Um, I agree. I'm just trying to think. I mean, we've, we've, here. yeah. You might, you might want to. Uh, Mr. Jones, why don't you step up to the podium here? You began uh, the meeting by telling me that it required four affirmative votes to approve a variance, and yet you're proposing a motion to deny a variance, which, if what you told me initially is correct, it seemed to me the motion should be to grant the variance, which would then fail if there are not four affirmative votes, and that would conclude the matter, wouldn't it? Um. Not if all of the elements haven't been found in the affirmative. 
And in this case, all of the elements have not been found in the affirmative. One of the elements has actually been um, found. Uh, we have been I'm, in opposition to. I guess what I'm suggesting is, if 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 the motion is to grant the variance, and more than one of you, since there's five voting found that not all of the criteria were met, then it would seem that less than four of you would vote in favor of that motion. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And, but and the, it seemed to me the motion ought to be to grant the variance and see whether it gets four votes or not. If you, if you make a motion to deny the variance and the, the motion either passes or fails on a three to two vote, I don't know where we are. And in, in we, we, and the reason that's what happened before was that each individual member of the board had a problem with one of the elements. And even though all the elements were, were voted Passed, in favor, it was, denied. it was denied. And that became the same dilemma. As a result we're of that. We're actually facing the opposite. But as a result of that, the, the, the town attorney basically said that your vote, your final vote, reflects whether the, whether the conclusions have been met or not. So the final vote is a formality right, to, to, to close the case. That's all it is. Once you find whether the conclusions are either met or not met, the vote. Isn't that correct, what the town attorney basically said, that it's a formality only? Okay, well, let me restate the, um, let me restate, um, the motion. Um, following Mr. Jones' suggestion, and I think it's a fair one. Um, could I have a motion from someone? Um, substantially as follows, and that is um, a motion to uh, approve the appeal of Kevin L. and Lisa M. Hutman, 10 Prout Place, Tax Map U53, Lot 33C, for a right side property line variance of three feet from the required 30 feet to construct an attached garage. So moved. Uh, motion, Mr. Keneally, a second. Ask, are we voting on whether all elements were met at this time? As I think, in essence, we are. Where the vote was self-explanatory that one of the elements was not approved. If it's a formality that we need a motion, we need to deny, vote down a motion to approve. Because otherwise it's ambiguity. If we approve a motion to deny it, it's by a three to two vote. There's ambiguity associated with that zone of the quorum, voting quorum, the motion is approved. If we have no quorum approving a motion, no quorum supporting a motion to approve, then not the attorney on the board. No, I think your, your explanation is right. So the motion has been made to approve. We need a second so we can vote on it. And we are just restating that not all of the elements were met. If you vote against the motion. Did we sound for all the, did you find for all the elements? What? Did you find for all the elements? I, I support it. I was in favor of all the elements. Okay, then you can second it. The rest of us can't because we didn't find for all the elements. So you're the only one who can second this motion. Well, then what is my obligation to vote then is my question. If I was in favor of it all along, of, of all the elements. But well, as a matter of procedural rule, I don't know 
and I want to stand corrected on this, but I don't know that making a motion or seconding a motion obligates you to vote one way or the other on a motion. I think you can bring a motion to the floor by either making the motion or seconding the motion for the purpose of debate, and you can still vote against a motion that okay. you've either made or seconded. I assumed if you brought it, you have to support. Um, like I said, I'm willing to stand corrected on yeah, that statement, know. but I, I think know. that's you know, the case. Let's, let's, when you bring a motion, do you have an obligation to vote in support of that motion? No. Well, then we can, anybody can talk. What did you say? No, the, he, you don't. He, no. There's no obligation yeah. incumbent on you if you second it to vote either way. It happens all the time that, that somebody will make a motion just to bring it on the floor. Well, I'll, sec okay. I'll yeah. second the motion. Can the chair second the motion? Nobody else will. I'll second well, it. I, all I ask is could you restate the motion? That's all. That's all right. Catherine offered to second the motion. Uh, the motion is to approve the appeal of Kevin L. and Lisa M. Hutman, 10 Prout Place, tax map U53, lot 33C, for a right side property line variance of three feet from the required 30 feet to construct an attached garage. Okay. Perfect. And the motion has been made by Jack, seconded by Catherine, Ms. Miller. It was made Discussion. by Jack. Pardon? It was made by Jack. Uh, Mr. Keneally, motion, second, Ms. Miller. Discussion on the motion. Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Two in favor, three opposed. The motion fails. Mr. Jones, that concludes that matter. I think you get the message that we fully expect that you're going to find a remedy to this within the town, but this just isn't the board to provide you with a redress. We're going to take a um, five-minute recess. Mr. Becker, for the benefit of several Chapman. people arrived late, for the benefit of those. the request of Raymond and Elizabeth Taylor because that's the only item left on our agenda. The next item on our agenda is to hear the request of Raymond and Elizabeth Taylor to Harrison Avenue, tax map U29, lot 1, for a conditional use permit to operate a home business, specifically an auto detailing business. Uh, Raymond and Elizabeth Taylor. Basically, I'm just here to answer any questions you may have. My uh, okay. Well, first, why don't you identify yourself for us, for for us, and for everyone watching at home? Excuse me. Identify yourself my, for us and for everyone watching at home, playing the home game. My name is Raymond Taylor. I live at Two Harrison Avenue, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I should identify for everyone, including you, Mr. Taylor, um, two items that were given to us um, this evening um, as supplements to the packet that you had provided. Um, hopefully, you have both of these. There, there are two handwritten letters, one from uh, Barbara K. McDonald, 
uh, dated July 17, and one from Sheila A. Roy, dated July 23. Have you seen either of these? I, I am unaware of them. Have you read both of those? Yes, I have. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay, well, uh, Mr. Taylor has indicated that he's um, here to answer questions that we might have. Um, and thank you for your application in the packet. It seems fairly self explanatory. Let me ask before we start asking you questions so we know are there other people here? to speak either in support of or in opposition to uh, this request? Is that to speak in favor of or? In favor of. Okay. Is, is Barbara McDonald here? No. Is Sheila Roy here? No. Well, Mr. Taylor, um, for the benefit of anyone who isn't uh, here tonight, uh, but may be watching um, from home, why don't you give us a, a thumbnail sketch of what your proposal is? Uh, basically, um, I, my, my clients will, uh, I'll either pick up or have them drop off a car. I will clean it, detail it. Nothing, waxing, that, that sort of thing. Um, I don't do a lot of volume. Um, over, over the process of a year, uh, there probably you know, wouldn't average out to be more than a few days a week uh, that I'm actually working on cars. In the summer and spring and summer, um, there may be more cars, but in the winter, um, there may, may be a week or two that I won't have any. So um, that, that's basically it. I work within the confines of my garage um, when the weather is, uh, is bad or seasonal. Um, and when it's uh, nice out, season, season and weather permitting, uh, I work, work in my driveway. That's, uh, that's basically it. Uh, I also go on location cleaning uh, cars and boats as well. To clean them at other people's homes that's or other correct. properties. Or of, the, or of other businesses, but that's uh, fairly uh, limited. Uh, do you work alone? Yes, I do. Did you formally conduct this business somewhere else? Yes, I've, I've been in the business for over 20 years. In auto in detailing? Yes, in, in, in Portland, in South Portland. And where were those other business locations? It's Portland and South Portland. Um, Katana Drive in South Portland. I was on Presumpscot Street uh, for seven or eight years, I believe it was. Um, originally, um, I started in Portland and uh, went from there. And were those always in commercial establishments, commercial properties? That's correct, yes. And do you anticipate that the volume of your business will be about the same working out of your house as uh, when you worked in a commercial location? 
No, less. Less. Because um, I don't have the time. I have a special needs child that I have to take care of um, in, in the mornings, a few days a week. So I, I really don't have the time to uh, devote 100% of my time to it, hence operating from my home. I have a question. What do you anticipate your hours being of operation? I, I do everything by appointment. Um, typically, I, I, I work from 8 in the morning you know, to 5. I try to keep it in between those parameters. How many cars would you have at your house at one time? There could be up to two, perhaps. Typically, I only like to have, I only like to have, I only can work on one at a time. So. Um, um, and you're, do you, you had a chance to look at Ms. Roy's letter. I have, yes. Okay. Would do you have any comments about that? Um, well, as far as the amount of traffic that's there, um, you know, I have no problem with limiting the amount of vehicles in the driveway at one time. Um, I certainly have made, um, I've, I've cer certainly made en uh, enough abundant space in my driveway to accommodate any cars. Okay, well, why don't we take each of them in turn. Um, sure. How do you feel about the vehicles on Harrison Avenue? Vehicles on Harrison Avenue. How many do you expect you'd ha need at any time? To actually park on Harrison Avenue, yeah. you mean? There wouldn't. There, there Is she wouldn't talking about? Could the I, letter's unclear whether she's talking about vehicles. Could I? Could I just uh, maybe clarify a point? Please. Um, in the past, uh, there has been vehicles queued on the street that that that. Uh, May not happen now if he gets approval. Okay. Is that a fair statement? That, that's correct. And I, I think I've that seen... was Sheila's concern that, okay. that she doesn't want to see what's happened there before I knocked on Mr. Taylor's door. Okay. And we just put a new uh, driveway, you know, double the size of the driveway. So you don't need the garage. that. Okay, so you won't need to no, use Harrison. No, not at all. He's willing to, after conversation to me, he's willing to limit vehicles that, that he's going to work on to a maximum of two okay. at any Good. given time. Okay. And I, that could be a condition of this board. Okay. Okay, Bruce, do you have any questions with respect to the materials he's using? Are they soaps or drains? No, that's, uh, I, I had some questions, and that's why he supplied the, uh, the soap, the, the uh, material data that he did. Um, okay. Are you on a septic system or public sewer? Uh, public sewer. And is there, a, is there a drain right at the end of your driveway? There. Uh, the public sewer? There is a drain at the end of my driveway, exactly. Yeah, right around the corner. It's not, that's drain, the drainage system. Not so. Right. It, it, a storm drain. Storm drain. Right. Um, when you wash in the driveway, presumably everything is going to go down the storm drain. Mm -hmm. it, right. That would be a correct, correct assumption. Um, somewhere in your materials, I seem to recall. A statement that there will be no hazardous materials right. used. Is that correct? Right. Um, I I did look at the the data sheet that you provided. Um, that apparently is from 3M. That's you use some of their materials. Correct. For your cleaning. This particular the one that that applies to washing vehicles is a 3M product. Um, I, I did see in the precautionary information section on this that, you know, with eye protection, it says, it says to avoid eye contact, avoid skin contact, avoid breathing of vapors, mists, or spray, wash hands after handling and before eating, do not ingest. I mean, it doesn't sound like it's 
great stuff to be around. It's a, it's a simple car wash. Um, I, I, I believe the chief ingredient in it is water, 90%, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly. But, um, you know, that's relatively speaking, I can look into using something else if, if the board uh, found that to be more desirable. That's not a problem. I think this is, this is a sort of boilerplate for the material safety data sheet, which is the format specified by the federal government. And um, I think if anything is more noxious than water, basically have to say avoid contact. So it doesn't, because it says that, it tells us nothing about the degree of yeah, and, and I realize that, and I don't purport to be an environmental engineer or understand at all anything that's in this data sheet. Um, I guess I'm just pointing out the only part of it that I did understand. Right. <laughs> Do you have, um, is your basement extend through the garage or is it? No, no, it's, you, you would access the basement <laughs> through the inside of the house. Okay. Do you, are you using the basement for the business at all? No. Okay. You had a diagram and I wasn't sure. No, no, it's a full <laughs> basement, a sort of access room for children to play in basically. Good. It's completely finished off. So people come and drop their cars off, or you go pick them up, or both? It's, uh, I Either. would say it's probably 60-40. I pick them up a lot. I have a lot of law firms in town and, and different other uh, customers, business owners, that I go downtown and pick up, deliver the cars. Um, on occasion, there will be somebody um, that I'll do a car for that. He'll drop them off. He's a car wholesaler, for instance, that uh, provides me a uh, fairly regular <coughs> amount of work, so I, he, he drops those off and they, they're in my driveway. Now just out of curiosity, I just sometime over in the last week received a flyer in my mailbox in my newspaper tube from someone advertising um, to do uh, auto detailing, to come to the home and do detailing. Was that from you? No. No, it wasn't. When I first started in business 20 years ago, I used to put out flyers on cars, and that was about it. And I used to put them in the driver's side door, because I don't like flyers, period. It's the least offensive way of doing it, as opposed to on the windshield and that sort of thing. But I haven't done that for many years. And your answer to the question wouldn't have affected one no, way I, or another. I understand. I, I the way I do this, which is curious, is whether no. that was part of the marketing. I question the reality of that, actually. So am I interpreting your application correctly that you do two cars per day maximum? If you average it out, I think if you average it out, it would probably be a lot less. I mean, you're talking over, over a five. I'm talking about maximum per day, two cars per day. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it ta takes me in some, in some instances, um, you know, five hours to do a car when you get into like a Suburban or something like that. I'm okay, so. So the maximum number of cars on any one day would be two. Yes. Which would also be the maximum number of cars that would be parked at your, at your facility slash residence. Correct. What about your own vehicles? They're going to be at the house sometimes. Uh, my wife works during the, uh, during the daytime, so a lot of the time uh, her vehicle's not there. And my vehicle is where I picked up or delivered the other person's cars. I don't have cars we have the shuttle, shuttle. But, but yeah there are occasions when um, there will be that many cars there okay. would you um, propose would you anticipate doing detailing um, outside in the driveway at night no that, that's not very effective I mean that what doesn't really make sense without any light I, I I have to go inside my garage, as cramped as it is. Um, I have to op operate. Um, if it came down to that, have, have it do it at night, which I seldom have to do. Um, but no. Well, and just what I'm thinking of is that you might have um, floodlights no. on the outside of your garage to permit you to work outside in the driveway at night. You can't, it's not, there's no, 
you can't it would not provide enough light to be able to do that it's, it's not feasible and I wouldn't want it lit up like a Christmas tree anyway I mean that this is my home as I stated in there it's my primary residence and, uh, and my wife works for hard whether they're where their gardens and I like the way the house looks and I don't want it to have any commercial look to it at all and that just raises red flags in my estimation and I drive by this often and I um, I have noticed the gardens and it is a very nice house so you guys do a good job at keeping well, we put a lot of time into it yeah you have, you have a very good exterior presence. You, uh, would this be a five day a week kind of business situation? I, I typically uh, operate five days a week. Um, there are times when, you know, again, um, you know, in the winter time, I don't have a lot of business for obvious reasons. Uh, people don't like getting their cars cleaned in the winter. So uh, I, mean, I, I work, I have other jobs that I do as well to supplement. Spring, summer, they're my two seasons. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm just, you know, normally a situation like this, the board may put conditions on an approval, mm -hmm. and the conditions that are normally based on the information you provided here are in response to questions, and so that's why I'm asking some of the questions I've asked. That is, I, there are there are times when I've had to do cars on the weekend, you know, Saturday, something like that. So I'm, I, I, I prefer to do it dur during the weekdays, but there are times when, you know, uh, I have to work on the weekend. But it's not the norm. Other questions? Dr. Chapmas? When did you purchase this property? How long did you live there? Three years ago. We purchased it. We've been living there for uh, five years. You've been there for five years? That's correct. Is this your <clears throat> primary occupation or primary source of income with you, or do you have other? For myself or, for, or for, for the family? For, no, no for this is my primary. This is my primary source of income. That, that's correct. As I stated before, I've been in the business for 20 some odd years. Uh, you've been doing this, have you been doing this at your home for the past? If so, how long have you been doing this at your home? Um, probably last year and a half. Why did you bring it before the board at this time? Um, basically, Mr. Uh, Smith stopped by and brought it to my attention that uh, I had to have a permit for this for this endeavor. So, um, are you you stated in your application that it wasn't your intent to put up a sign? But do you advertise? Do you have? Are you listed in the phone directory, for example, with that address? There is a one listing, uh, a simple line listing, period. In, in the yellow pages, for example? I believe so, yes. Uh, it's in the letter from Ms. Roy, She suggests that you restrict all vehicles from Harrison Avenue. Have you in the past parked on Harrison Avenue? The vehicle? There, there, there have been times before I had my driveway widened that uh, a car had to be parked on the street. Yes. She also mentioned in her letter utility rentals, boats. Is this an issue for you? Excuse me? In her letter, yes. she says, including utility rentals, I assume she means rental trucks, boats, et cetera. I had a rider truck at my uh, residence in the last 24 hours. I believe that what she might be referring to. Is that related to the business? No. Oh, I was moving some equipment around. Okay. 
house. Mm. That's all I have for you. I have. Okay, well, we have um, two sets of standards here. We have the standards for conditional use approval, and we have conditions for approval. And it just might be helpful on pages 44 and, I'm, I'm sorry, 54 and 55 of the ordinance um, for the board members to look at uh, in deciding whether they have any additional questions. Um, and in the meantime, um, is there someone else who would like to speak in favor of the proposal? If you would come up to the podium, please. And Mr. Taylor, you might as well stay up here just in case there are other questions to come up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Peter Carter. I reside at 21 Ocean House Road and have resided there for the past 19 years. I am a neighbor to the Taylors. I live directly across the street from them. They own the property at the junction of Harrison Avenue and Route 77. I have no objections to the Taylors considering and continuing rather their business. Uh, I do believe reasonable conditions can be placed on his application for a permitted use, uh, restricting the hours between eight and five, perhaps just one rather than two of the weekend days, and perhaps restricting the number of client vehicles that can be on or about the property at any one given time. Um, I have watched the operation from my living room windows for a number of years. I don't find it objectionable. There have been periods of time, as this has been stated in Ms. Roy's letter, that there have been a number of clients' vehicles there. Uh, during the spring, occasionally Mr. Taylor will detail a boat as well as a car. Uh, vehicles have been parked on Harrison Avenue. However, Mr. Taylor has curtailed his business a great deal. That has not been evident in the recent past. Uh, Mr. Taylor relocated his business to that area, uh, leaving a commercial building in South Portland because of the increased value in commercial real estate. His rents increased to such a point that his business couldn't handle it. As a self-employed contractor, I can understand easily how that happens. Uh, there are a number of people in the neighborhood that operate businesses from their home. Many of them are similar to me. I am a self-employed contractor. I do store equipment at my property. I do not operate from my home, and I do not complete any work within my home. There is also a substantial commercial agricultural operation, second largest in this town within a thousand feet of his home. There's a church directly across the street. There's a very large livestock operation in the care and boarding of horses within 1,500 feet of his house. There's a very large medical office building within 3,000 feet of his house. If you allow us to traverse over the Cape South Portland line, there's a large commercial district within less than two tenths of a mile at the junction of Sawyer and Old Oceanus Road. There are, I believe, two permitted home offices, uh, home occupation businesses within the neighborhood. Uh, but if you just simply drive by this property, I've been there long enough that this was at one time a very nondescript single-story ranch house with a screened-in carport. Uh, since the Taylors have taken possession of this property and have owned it, the back lot has been fully landscaped, the side lot has been fully landscaped, the carport has been enclosed into a year-round garage. The home has been painted. Uh, the property has been fenced, and it has, well, in that particular neighborhood, I think it's the best appealing house on the road as far as visual effect from the road, especially because of Mr. Taylor's ability to maintain a wildflower garden. Uh, it's not offensive to me whatsoever, and I'm his closest neighbor. And I ask you to consider his application in the affirmative with some reasonable conditions that will allow him to continue to operate. And I know it's not in the code, but I know Mr. Taylor does work at home so that he can help a special needs child. I'd like to continue to have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Taylor, what, um, do you want to propose some reasonable restriction on hours that you think would satisfy your neighbors? Uh, Sure, that, absolutely. And that work for you, obviously. Right. Yeah. Um, yes, de de definitely. Um, you know, I think working between 8 and 6, something like that, when it's, when it's light out, you know, obviously, and, um, 
when it's when it's cold, I, you know, I close my door and never even know I <laughs> have anything going on there. And I think that um, I mean what you want to do inside your garage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that really makes a difference to us. If you want to clean cars at 11 o'clock at night inside your garage, does does that matter? It may be a concern if the door is open. Right. No, but I would make sure that that wouldn't be the case. You know, I can I'll work with you on that on that respect. I I prefer not to do that. Okay. Um, so if we were to limit the hours um, from 8 a.m. until 6 p.m., that works for that, you? That, that's certainly reasonable. How about weekends? Do you typically work on the weekends? I'd like to have the ability to be able to, but I prefer not. I, I prefer to get my work done five days a week so I can have the weekends free, but uh, there are times when it necessitates me to work on the weekend. Do you work, would you work either day or is it always Saturday? I prefer, again, to, you know, Saturday is more of a, you know, I, I get really, I get more, most of my work Monday through Friday, um, especially when I'm picking up and delivering cars for customers that are down, downtown that are working. That's where they are. That's, that's when they're working. If you want the opportunity to work Saturday, that's what the I'd like to be. Yes. Yeah. Well, like, so do you need it for Sunday too, or do you think? It's, it's I'd like to be able to. I'd like to have have that ability to do that. For instance, there are times when I won't have work for uh, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and then for some fluky reason, somebody will call me up and say, "Wait, I've got a car I need cleaned. We're going away on a trip on Monday. I don't want to be okay. excluded from having to be able to do it on that." But that, that's, that's certainly not the norm, but I don't want to exclude myself from doing that. Well, I, think, I think it's reasonable to limit it at the hours of operation and not the days. He clearly doesn't mm. work seven days a week, so I think giving him that flexibility is kind of the, the feature of having a home business that's desirable. So, no, so no vehicles on Harrison Avenue. Correct. Um, no more than two vehicles that belong to other people on your property at any one time. Okay. Client vehicles. Client vehicles. Um, client vehicles is a good way to describe it. Um, no signage. Correct. On the property. Um, Hours limited to between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. Would you state seven days a week, please? Uh, seven days a week. Uh, what other conditions um, might board members want well, to impose? Well, it was a condition that's part of his application. It's the number of vehicle trips per day that the home business will generate, which was four max per day. So that's actually integral to this application. That's equivalent to two vehicles. Well, but we're saying that's different than two client vehicles on the property at any one time. <clears throat> I mean, theoretically, if you could do four vehicles a day, you could have two on the property at a time. Well, he says it's right. Convert yeah, that to, to eight vehicle trips, right? It's two trips per vehicle. One to bring it in, one to take one it coming in, one coming out. That's correct. I think the issue, at least from the neighbor's standpoint, is that you don't have you have room for two, but anything more than that, at any given time, is a problem. So, I mean, 77 is such a heavily traveled road that I can't imagine that a couple extra vehicle trips it will will matter to the neighborhood. Combine that with the fact that he only can work so many hours a day, it's not like he can do 20 vehicles in that day. That's and considering also the fact that I'm at the end of the street, um, the, the person who, who wrote this letter is way inside. She, 
I mean, everybody has to come by. All the traffic to my neighborhood goes by my house in addition to Route 77. So it's, it, it's really not an issue for everybody all the way in. I mean, they don't even, they don't I, don't, I, I don't get it, uh, but, but that's neither here nor there. I, I'll, I'll do whatever you folks uh, deem necessary. I'm comfortable if we're limiting his hours of operation and the number of vehicles, client vehicles in the driveway in the vicinity, and that we don't need to limit how many turnovers he can make, because he only can make as many as in the hours permit. So if there's the occasion that he only had to do some, a short detail and was able to turn that car over. I mean, there are times when, I, when I'll do a vehicle, sometimes I'll do a wash back window, or, or, or a quickie on a car, and then go, Bring it over, bring it back into somebody, and grab another one and do another quickie on it. So, I mean. um, maybe one of the conditions could be um, continue to use biodegrade, bio. Mm -hmm. What did you ask? Not bio. Nutrient. Non toxic. Well, he does indicate the soap I use for this is biodegradable. Okay. In fact, I can look into um, finding another option. So, yeah. well, as long as I think you're using it, what you consider to be a, a safe right. product. Yep. One of the questions on the application is, will there be anyone employed who is not a resident and you check no? Do you foresee that changing in the future? No. So you, you could accept a condition of no employees? <laughs> okay, any others? You, you I assume, use uh, vacuums and, and power buffers and things of this nature. Is, is, is noise an issue, or has it? Ever been? No. With a vacuum cleaner, uh, the, never. The shop vac, which correct. can be quite that's, noisy. That's correct. No, it's it's never been an issue. I'm very sensitive to my neighbors. Um, you know, Barbara McDonald lives right next door to me. Um, you know, and I, and I, I, you know, I ask her sometimes when I, when I'm work, working. You know, is everything fine? Oh yeah, and she was, you know, surprised. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Smith. How durable is this conditional use? Would, will it pass to the next owner? Will it pass to what? If he sells his property, will this conditional use pass to the new owner? If you look on page 55, it, it talks about the duration of conditional use approval. The grant of permission for as long as the property is used for such purposes. The conditional use shall expire if the owner physically alters his property or structure so it no longer can be used, ceases to use the property for the approved conditional use for one year, or fails to initiate the operation within a year. Um, so my interpretation is that, that if he happened to sell a house tomorrow who had, to another person who had a condition, uh, who wanted to do all auto detailing, that he could do it, but only to the extent of the approval that was granted tonight. In other words, I don't think it makes any difference who's running it as long as it's run the same. So it's understood that the conditional use permit is granted for this one one use only. Right. And the board can make it a condition that, that upon his termination of the business that or his moving out that, that it's not passed on to another owner. I mean, you could do that. And that's described as auto detail. Okay, are we ready to go on to the elements? Okay, well, similar to the uh, various elements for 
um, a, a variance. Let's go through the various elements one at a time just by a showing of hands. Um, uh, let's see a show of hands from members of the board who are satisfied that any conditions that we do attach um, for the conditional use uh, will be satisfied by uh, Mr. Taylor, recognizing that we haven't imposed the conditions yet, but we still need to make a finding that we're satisfied. Well, we need to make a finding that the conditions will be satisfied as a condition of our approval. So, um, on that first element, um, that's found in the affirmative. Uh, five in favor. Um, those who find that the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. And that's found in the affirmative. Five in favor, zero opposed. Those who find that the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, or other aspects of its design or operation. Also in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Those who find that the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of adjacent properties. Found in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Uh, next, those who find that the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with a comprehensive plan. It's not really applicable, but um, in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. And last, uh, those who find that the design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood, although it need not have a similar design appearance or architecture. Again, that's not really applicable, uh, but we need to at least make a finding on it. Um, and that's in the affirmative, five in favor, zero opposed. Um, and from the discussion, um, it sounds like the conditions that the board um, is inclined to, oppose, inclined to impose are the following, um, that um, Mr. Taylor shall um, park no vehicles on Harrison Avenue, that uh, Mr. Taylor will be limited to a maximum of two client vehicles on the property at any one time, that there will be no signage advertising the presence of the business on the property, that the business will be conducted only between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., seven days a week permitted, that Mr. Taylor will have no employees working for him from the home. And were there any others? User friendly soap or user friendly product. How do we uh, want to <laughs> describe that for purposes of the record? Uh, that no hazardous material. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's no hazardous materials. Or do you have right. Yeah, I, th I dig in that there, there are plenty of uh, there are environmentally um, friendly. I have no idea what any of these terms mean and whether they have any enforceable meaning. And since, as code enforcement officer, you're the one who needs to enforce it. Um, uh, if we require that he use environmentally friendly Safe. product. Safe. I'm not Trying quite sure what that means. Um, well, you're, putting, you're putting soap into storm drains, which goes into the water table, basically. So you want something that's fully biodegradable. I, I assume that there are any number of state and federal laws that limit what you can pour down a storm drain under any circumstance, but maybe not. I mean, I know there's an awful lot of very toxic stuff that you're allowed to buy and put down your drain. Yeah, but I think, I think biodegradable now has a legal meaning that it biodegrades into components that are non-noxious. Are you, as our resident scientist, willing to uh, go with biodegradable? I don't believe it has legal meaning now. Non-toxic, biodegradable. 
that sound okay? We can use both. Yeah. Okay. So as an additional condition uh, that the cleaning products used be non-toxic and biodegradable. Any other conditions? Uh, yes, if you come up to the podium so everyone can hear. And tell us your name, please. I'm Elizabeth Taylor, Raymond's wife, and I reside at 2 Harrison Avenue. Um, we have a physical therapist that comes to our house once a week also, which is an additional vehicle. And if we're having personal guests, are they allowed to park on the street? It, um, yes, the, what we're referring to are restrictions on vehicles related to the auto detailing business. Maybe it so it's appear that there are additional vehicles at times because we do have a physical therapist that comes to the house weekly in the afternoon. So we're, we're limiting this to two client vehicles okay. but at any one the, time. If Ms. Roy has an objection, it may appear that there's more vehicles there than actually that are clients' vehicles, personal friends or this physical therapist that comes every week. How many vehicles does your driveway? Well, she, she drives one vehicle at a time, but she has different vehicles that she drives. I mean, how drives. many will fit in your driveway? How many total vehicles? If he's working in the driveway, you know, two additional vehicles in addition to two or th maybe four vehicles at a time. So if, if everyone if ran, you know, there may be occasion that there's five vehicles there. All in the driveway? No, the, the physical therapist parks on the street because street parking is permitted, correct? All right. I, I, th I think it, it'll, it'll please itself. I mean, I, I think if I st happen to stop in and there's four vehicles that you, two of which are on a street that you, that you got lined up, to, that's a problem. But if I stop in because it's too many and, and, and one of them is your physical therapist, I, I, I mean, or I'll, be on, I'll be on my way, right. I mean, okay. I think it'll only become a problem sure if it's, if it's something that, that happens it. often and, and, and I need to stop because of that. Uh, and then. Okay, well, it, it yeah, we'll may appear to. that there's more vehicles there than he's actually working on, is what I was getting at. Okay. But your driveway will comfortably hold four vehicles? That's correct. So even if you have two client vehicles on the property, mm -hmm. I mean, in theory, your therapist, your physical therapist vehicles, should be able to park... Personal vehicles and a physical therapist could be five vehicles. Okay. Or, you know... Two personal vehicles, two client vehicles. How many of which would be parked on the road, though? Just probably just the one extra. I mean, just, okay. you know, somebody who's visiting tends to park on the street instead of in your driveway if he's working. I think it's important to, 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 to try to keep your own vehicles in your driveway along with the two that, that you're working on. And then if there's an overflow, it's personal, then that's not an issue. Okay. Okay? Is that all right? Yeah, I mean, it. The point, I guess, is a good one. It doesn't make sense to keep the client vehicles in the driveway and, as a result, keep your personal vehicles in the street. I mean, I don't think the neighbors care whether it's the client vehicles that are in the street or your vehicles that are in the street. They don't want vehicles lined up in the street. So, so, so should we change that from, if it says no vehicles in Harrison, should you say that clients' vehicles and First personal owner's vehicles shall be in the driveway. But we just keep it as no client vehicles on Harrison. Just, just limit the. Well, oh, but that doesn't. What Dave said that doesn't make sense. You, you put that two vehicles out on the road all the time. You might as well let the clients' vehicles stay out there and theirs in the driveway. I mean, I think the it's the the idea of trying to keep keep the business and the personal vehicles off the road. I, maybe I'm wrong on that, but. Yeah, I think the intent that we're trying to get to would be that, there, that neither, neither your personal vehicles nor client vehicles are in the road. Because it would be defeating the whole purpose of it to have your, your, your personal cars parked in the road all the time. So client vehicles and personal vehicles 
not on Harrison Avenue, right? right? Is that during hours of business operation? My concern is you're telling people they can't park their personal car. We're telling people they can't park yeah, their that's personal a, that's cars a concern on the street as well. if their child or somebody wants to go play in their driveway. Um, so is it just during business operation, like 8 to 6, or when there would be client vehicles there? Well, I think it has to be related to the business. So okay. yeah, I think it's defined to, to so the hours of operation. I mean, if it's okay. beyond the hour of operation, the business isn't in, in ongoing, and therefore they can do what anybody could do. Right, right. That's the point. I think the you know it's logical to to try to to get a stipulation there that they don't take theirs out of out of the yard to make room for their business. Right. I mean, I, I I think that's a concern of the neighborhood. So it would be during hours of operation, I guess. That probably would be understood. Is that okay? Do you keep client vehicles overnight? There are times when I have to do that, yes. Monkey range, yeah. <clears throat> well, just so everybody knows the problem we're struggling with right. here is that if it, if we're trying to satisfy the neighbor's concern about vehicles in the street, we uh, again we don't want either client vehicles um, in the street, and we certainly don't want client vehicles in the driveway. And as a result of the client vehicles in the driveway, the personal vehicles in the street. But we also don't want, as Ms. Jordan suggested, to impose a restriction that wouldn't be imposed on anyone else, and that is the ability to park their car at how the about, end of the driveway in the street. How about uh, all attempt will, will be made to keep as many vehicles in the yard and off Harrison Avenue as possible? Yeah. Do you have a boat also that's parked there? I have a boat, but it's docked at DeMillo's Marina. Uh, year round, it stays at DeMillo. I don't keep the boat. Let's put it this way: when the, when the, when the season is over, I keep it on location um, at a Rio Marina. It was last year. I don't keep it at the house. Yeah, no, the reason I asked is Mrs. Roy, Ms. Roy, letter referred to boats, and I didn't know whether that was referring to something specific that she had observed and was. I mean, I've cleaned, I've cleaned a boat. I mean, there have been times when I'll have to jockey, I'll, I'll put a uh, boat in. So he's referring to a boat that you're cleaning, you're detailing, not, not your own boat. It, it, it could have been my boat. I, 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 mean, I've, I had it out once to bring it up to a lake and flush fresh water through it uh, within the last couple of weeks, so that's probably um, what it was. I, I probably put it in the street for a minute okay, I just, and then switch I concern was just whether or not there's always a boat. No, not at all. Not at all. It's all, and, it's and, all my and I think it, I, I, get, I get back to the, my previous statement earlier that, that I believe her concern was based on the fact that you did have more than two vehicles, client vehicles, at times. There was probably a time when, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm I, I made that assumption, but. That's not that I don't I don't remember when that would have, it's, it's very possible it's very possible but it, but that again that's not the norm how is this for a possible solution no client vehicles on Harrison Avenue correct and no personal vehicles on Harrison Avenue while you have client vehicles in the driveway it's reasonable So if you don't have client vehicles in the driveway and you want to park your personal vehicle on the street because you want to have your child or children able to play in the driveway uh -huh. or you want to just clear out your driveway for any reason because you're doing something in the driveway, mm -hmm. you have that prerogative just like any other homeowner does. 
but you're not going to leave your cars on the street because you have client vehicles in the driveway. Does that work? The wisdom of Solomon. Not necessarily, but... <laughs> uh, that works well. Okay. All right. Quick review of the conditions since we muddled it a little bit. Um, no vehicles on Harrison Avenue. No personal vehicles on Harrison Avenue while there are client vehicles in the driveway or in the garage. Um, a maximum of two client vehicles on the property at one time. No signage on the property advertising the business. Uh, business hours are limited to uh, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it is permissible to operate the business seven days a week. Uh, no employees uh, for the business on the property. And you will limit your use of uh, cleaning materials to those that are non-toxic and biodegradable. Very reasonable. Everybody comfortable with that? Um, how about a motion from someone to approve the application subject to those stated conditions? So moved. <laughs> that was easy. The more we think about this, the more I'm... Okay, well, tell, tell us what you're thinking. The more I'm uncomfortable with enforcing no parking standards on a on the side of a road that allows parking. <laughs> I, I, if we're limited two vehicles, client vehicles, to any time, I, I think that's. That was my instinct from the get go. From I I think that if we limit it to two vehicles at any time, then so we should may not get into the where it should be parked. Um, I, I'm not comfortable. I agree, Mr. Taylor. You, you see our concern, and that is that you are going to be. We all have the right to park on the streets. You are going to be looked at in a little more critical eye by your neighbors because of because of your conditional use, because of your in-home business. That's our, our con concern is obvious, and I agree with Mr. Smith that we have that you need to you need to be as courteous and respectful as, as possible. I don't know that we can put the... the well, and that's why I suggested, like, every attempt will be made to utilize the driver to its fullest. Something to that effect. Um, but I, I, the onus is on you to... That's to, fine. ...to, to that's manage fine. your operations as to have minimal impact on your, on your neighbors. However you, you know, deal with it, I think our, our intent is obvious. Okay. Bruce, tell me again what your concern is. Well, I, I just don't. I, I don't. You, you you don't like the idea of telling them that if there are client vehicles in the driveway that they can't park on the street. I don't like the idea of trying to make a judgment as to when they can park their personal vehicles on the street. So I, I have no problem confining the, you know, the client vehicles maybe should be parked in the driveway, but that. That means the other vehicles might be on the street. So um, I think if you limit the business to two client vehicles at any given time, I think it takes care of itself. And if you want to park on the street, your own vehicles, and then it's allowed. There's no no parking signs down there. I think it should be allowed. I don't want to police. I don't want to have to police no parking on the street that you can park. Mm -hmm. I think. You know, every attempt should be made to utilize the parking place. So in other words, if I went by and all the cars were out on the road and none was in the yard, I'd probably stop and say, well, geez, you know, let's get some of these off the road. But um, so that's why I say every attempt should be made to utilize the driveway to its fullest. Uh, and maybe that's a condition that we should write in there. Um, but I liked your point that by limiting it to two cars, it's taking care of itself. Right. And then the rest is. You 
Well, we can't legislate courtesy <laughs> by our well, organization. I think, I, I, I think I, if I get a call from the it will be based on the fact that it may have got out of hand. Or, or if it didn't get out of hand, that I can go down and find out what's going on and I can report back to the neighbor that this is what's, you know, the mother and father's up from Virginia and there's one of that's one of that guys and, and the, the physical therapist is there and that's why you see more cars in the street than normal. Um, if I go there and, I, and there's four client vehicles and he's going to get a violation letter. Um, that's so. a violation. Okay, so we're just we want to eliminate the part that says we're going to we're going to scrap the condition that said no personal vehicles on Harrison Avenue. Yep. Yeah. But retain no client vehicles on Harrison Avenue. Right? No client vehicles allowed on Harrison. Yeah, cuz if he's got she only two client vehicles there and he's ample opportunity in the driveway space in the driveway. He doesn't need road. Right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you that. Had, um, you only have two car, client cars there at any time. That's so correct. So you always can fit more than two cars in oh, the yeah. driveway. So there can always be two client cars in the driveway. That, that's you correct. You don't need client cars on the road. That's correct. Okay. So, quick review. Conditions, no client vehicles on Harrison Avenue. Maximum of two client vehicles on the property at any one time. No signage advertising the business. Hours of operation limited to uh, between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, no employees um, on the property uh, related to the auto detailing business. Um, and use of cleaning materials is limited to those that are non-toxic and biodegradable. We're there? So moved, Ms. Miller, second, Mr. Keneally. Discussion on the motion, hearing none, all those in favor? The motion is approved. Thank you. Your application is approved. Appreciate it. Next item on our agenda is communications. We have none. Next item on the agenda is adjournment. I have Anybody like to make a motion to adjourn or you have a communication? Uh, neither. I have a, a, a comment. Uh, this past week I received a direct mailing in the mail from, from an applicant. I'd like comment from, from Mr. Smith. And we, advised, we advised against that and, and she chose to do that anyways. Um, I can't stop her from doing it. I, I can only advise him that that's not proper, which she was advised of. So. If you were aware that the, this was sent out? I wasn't aware until I talked to Mr. Backer today, this morning, that, that you had received a copy. No. She was advised not to do that. She brought 10 copies in for the board uh, as asked. I was going to pass them out the night of the meeting. She was advised actually before the packets went out that, that she could, we could put them in the packet. She got it in at time and she didn't. Uh, that said, she brought 10 copies in after we advised her not to send them out. And I guess she chose to do both. You, you asked that they not be sent out directly? Yes. And they, they were sent? They were sent anyways. In, in the, that's what I was interested in, your comments on how appropriate this was. Uh, if we do receive mailings like this, uh, do we do we consider that? I don't think it necessarily je jeopardizes anything. I just I just it's been a, it's, it's always been a position that the, the, the board members individually shouldn't have to receive a bunch of mailings and try to piece together even what application it may go to if it's not directly related to an address. For instance, somebody could send a letter out to the board and not be clear enough to even understand if you have several items. So I, I think it's, you know, we advise people not to do that. Okay. Thank you. Motion for adjournment. Move we adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? 
we are adjourned.